Welcome back to Let's Talk About Today with Arvin. Today on the show, I am very, very excited to have an esteemed guest, uh, someone who I frankly look up to. He's pretty awesome. He's uh, been a you know longtime fighter for uh, Ontarians here in uh, you know fighting for what's good, making sure our province is heading in the right direction. He's an awesome representative, an awesome politician. He's the MPP of Don Valley East, Michael Cotel. Michael, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Awesome. So, Michael, um, you know, I haven't spoken to you in a long time. I want to know, how, how are you doing during this pandemic? How has it been, you know, interacting with your constituents? I hope your family's doing well. You know, we're, we're all great. We're very uh, fortunate, um, you know, to be together. And uh, my father's, uh, you know, we, uh, I do spend a lot of time with my father who lives uh, pretty close to me. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, it's been, uh, it's been good for us. Um, but as a uh, as an MPP and as the representative of Don Valley East, it's uh, you know you're exposed to a lot of the challenges people that are people are going through. Um, a few days ago, we sent out a message just letting people know that we are here to help them, and um, we got a lot of uh, feedback from folks. And over the last uh, almost year now, um, issues like food security, um, you know, being able to pay the bills, and just mental health have really come to the forefront. Definitely. For sure. That's, that's awesome that, you know, you, despite all the hardships, you know, you're still making sure to connect with your constituents. Um, I know it's definitely, you know, very difficult because everything, you know, the only way we can do it is via phone or via call. And so that's, that's awesome. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. So Michael, I, I want to start off because you, you've had an interesting career in politics. You're definitely an interesting person. Um, but I want to start off with, uh, you know, what sort of inspired you to uh, get interested in politics? You know, you studied political science at Carleton. Um, and so coming out of high school, what sort of motivated you to want to study politics? So it was actually before high school. Um, there were two, two things that happened to me. And I tell this uh, story a lot when I do go into uh, schools and talk about just politics and, you know, how I got involved. But I can remember going into a... Um, uh, a campaign office, uh, not knowing what it was, a few of our, you know, a few of my friends, we must have been, you know, 12, 13, walked into this office, um, started eating the cookies and, uh, you know, just uh, pretending that we were just part of, I guess, the team. And um, it was a conservative uh, candidate that was, uh, that was running. And I can remember uh, everyone watching, um, the TV was showing the debate between, um, between uh, John Turner and Brian Mulroney. And I remember uh, that was the first time I was politically conscious. And I watched and uh, you know, didn't know who those people were on the TV, but I knew that they had something to say. And uh, from that point forward, I really started to pay attention to politics when I saw it on television or a newspaper. I didn't seek it out, but when it was exposed to me in any type of um, medium, uh, from television, radio, and print, I would just automatically, uh, you know, pay attention. Second thing was, um, uh, when I was about 15, 16, there were some kids playing in the backyard, and it was, it was frozen, and there was a bit of water um, uh, in the pool. So if, 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 if someone fell through, they would, uh, you know, they could possibly uh, hurt themselves. So I told the uh, superintendent of the building that it needs, there was a big hole in the fence that they needed to fix it because kids were going in and out and playing on this ice that was melting. And uh, no one listened to me. And I called uh, the, uh, the owner of the building. I called the, the real estate company. I called so many different folks to try to fix it. And no one listened. So then I called the MPP. And within one hour, that hole was being fixed. And it kind of, uh, you know, dawned on me at that point that if you wanted to actually improve your community, if you wanted to do things differently, uh, being involved in politics was one of those mechanisms where you could actually get change done. And that's what those two things kind of pulled me in that direction. Wow, that's 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 like a really awesome story. That's like so genuine how, you know, you were just with a couple of your friends, you went to a campaign office and then you took action yourself as, you know, a young man, you know, seeing there's an issue in your community and you saw firsthand that, um, you know, if you want to get things done, making sure that you're connecting with your, you know, elected representatives, you can actually get things changed and improved in the community. That's, that's awesome. 
Um, so Michael, for new listeners and folks who, you know, may not know you as well, um, can you tell us a bit, you know, about your career before politics? You know, as you said, you, you had this interest in politics, but you were doing a lot of interesting things, uh, you know, after graduation and before you entered, uh, you know, threw your hat in the ring. Yeah, I, um, I, when I finished university and just near the end of university, I worked for John Manley, who was the minister of industry at the time. And then um, at about 2000, I left and I went to South Korea for uh, two years, uh, came back from South Korea. I taught English there, came back from South Korea and uh, decided to run for school board trustee. I won that election. I was around 29, 30 years old, won that election and um, ran two more times after that. So from 2003 to 2011, I was a, I was a school board trustee. Uh, served as the vice chair of the board. And um, after that, I, uh, I ran in 2011 to be a member of provincial parliament. But while I was a school board trustee, I was also the executive director of a not-for-profit organization called Alpha Plus. It's a national literacy organization. And um, I took a leave of absence to run provincially. And um, you know, when I won in 2011, um, obviously left uh, that position and uh, became a, uh, an MPP. And then I believe it was about a, almost a year and a bit later, I became a minister and it was for citizenship and immigration. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that's, that's really interesting how before you would enter uh, provincial politics, you already, you know, rolling up the sleeves and, um, you know, doing some work as, uh, you know, Toronto uh, school board trustee and, um, you know, helping out with a nonprofit. And that's, that's really fascinating. So what sort of like, I guess, motivated you to want to make that leap and sort of um, get into provincial politics? Well, it's interesting because it wasn't part of my plan. You know, I, um, I've always been, I, I personally have always been, um, I was exposed to and part of the federal government under Kretchen. You know, I was, uh, I was the president of my, um, my, my liberal uh, campus club, at Carleton University, I was uh, very involved in uh, in the Young Liberals, and um, you know, for me, uh, it was a um, you know, federal politics was something I was always always interested in. Uh, 2011, I remember I was at home one night. It was just uh, before bed, and uh, my Twitter started to you know, my name started to come up a lot. Back then, if your name came up 15, 20 times, it was a it was a big deal, right? And uh, it was from a, a Toronto Star story that was put out saying um, something like David Kaplan has decided not to run. He was my predecessor. He was the MPP uh, for Don Valley East. And um, so he, he decided he wasn't running again. And um, he said in a comment that, you know, that Michael would be, you know, a good person to take over the position. And uh, the next day, I got a few phone calls from people within the party. I got phone calls from people locally, and they asked me to consider running. And um, I decided that, um, you know, uh, I would do it. And uh, probably six weeks later, I was an MPP. So it was just a very short process going. The transition was, was really swift. And uh, in less than two months, I went from you know, not thinking about it to, uh, to being an MPP. Wow. That is like so unique as in like, you know, you're already a leader within the community and then sort of, I guess the opportunity came to you versus like, you know, some people who perhaps are, you know, setting their eyes on uh, entering provincial politics, but it's interesting how the opportunity came to you and it was, you know, the right time and you're the right guy for the role. Right. Um, and so, you know, as you mentioned in 2011, you became a member of the provincial parliament in Don Valley East. And, you know, you, you, you were, you know, you spent a lot of time in the liberal government in various roles, as you mentioned, you know, minister of uh, citizenship and immigration, minister of tourism, culture, and sport minister of children, and youth services. And you've had many other roles as well. And, you did a lot of groundbreaking and impactful work. Um, you know, I recall, you know, during those, those years in the liberal government where you were a part of, uh, Ontario grew to become a, you know, leading economy in the G7. Um, so a lot of fantastic work and a lot of fantastic initiatives were sort of, um, started off during those years. Um, 
share with us, you know, some of those experiences. It, it must have been really interesting, you know, getting into provincial politics and uh, becoming such a you know strong leader within the government. And you know, what's some of the work perhaps you know you're most proud of during that time? I am. Um... You know, we as a government, so I th- think there's a, a lot of things, a lot of good things that we did. Um, but the, the things that stick out with me the most was the reform to, uh, to OSAP. Um, I thought that um, that just opened up uh, the possibility of, of going back to post-secondary or going to post-secondary for the first time. It opened up a whole new uh, group of individuals that were accessing uh, post-secondary because of that funding. Um, I was proud of the uh, uh, providing medicine for uh, people under 18. I thought that was, um, you know, that's a pretty serious highlight uh, for, for the government. Um, and um, even, you know, I came in at the tail end of uh, McGinty's uh, time and uh, just working on, you know, being part of a government that was responsible for full day kindergarten and making it easier for families to, uh, you know, for, for parents to get back into the workforce. Um, and uh, it really, it saved families almost $7,000 a year. But I would say the number one accomplishment, and you know, all of these accomplishments to me are all about, you know, they're, they're based on children and young people, right? But I really believe um, the strengthening of our education system and um, educational peace within Ontario for, for quite some time was uh, was a really important thing, and um, you know I was proud as a as a parent, as a former school board trustee, and um, you know as a former minister of children and youth services. I was really proud of the government's uh, record on making Ontario the best place, you know, among the best in the world to raise a child. Yeah, for sure. That's that's fantastic. You know, I. I as a you know, young person growing up in Ontario, definitely lots of those policies impacted me and my family. And it was, it was, it was fantastic for sure. Um, and thank you for your work during that time as well. My pleasure. Uh, so thanks. Uh, so Michael, I, I want to sort of shift into, um, you know, what's been going on under Premier Ford's leadership. Um, you know, before the pandemic, we really wanted of course, Ontarians, Premier Ford and the Ford government to succeed. Uh, I know that you and many Liberal members, you know, did your job to hold them to account, um, you know, critique uh, what they were doing, whether, you know, it was the cuts to education, cuts to health care, um, cu- you know, cuts to the autism programs as well. Um, but, you know, during this pandemic, it's it's been absolutely devastating and heartbreaking. You know, we've seen with the long-term care homes issue. Uh, it really hits home, right. you know, close to home for me because, uh, you know, in the Simcoe Muskoka Barrie area, uh, in the Roberta Place Long-Term Care Home Center and here in Barrie, uh, we've seen, you know, over 60 deaths. And it's, it's you know, we've also seen some of the first cases of the UK variant, you know, locally. And it's, it's absolutely right. heartbreaking to see that so many people rely on these long-term care homes to take care of, you know, their parents, their grandparents, their loved ones. And day by day, the numbers keep adding up and we're sort of seeing this inaction from the Ford government. It's like they're idling by and they're not really stepping up to the stage and uh, taking action on this. So, you know, how would you assess Premier Ford's leadership during this pandemic? And uh, perhaps what do you think is something that he immediately needs to focus on? So um, I, I think this is a great question because um, even the, the way you lead the question, the lead of the question um, around, you know, wanting the government to, to be successful, you know, throughout this entire pandemic, there's no question that uh, myself, I believe all members of the legislature want the government to be successful when it comes to um, the agenda around uh, the COVID response. You know, for me, it is important that we get vaccines out there for people that people are, you know, that access to testing and tracing, contact tracing, um, enough space in hospitals for, 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 for folks to access healthcare. And of course, uh, making sure that our long-term care homes are positioned uh, to be successful to some of our most vulnerable citizens. And that's our, our seniors in long-term care, 80,000 seniors across Ontario. Um, so I think that's an important piece that, you know, I have to constantly say, because it's, it's the truth. And 
you know, it's hard being uh, critical of government uh, during a pandemic like this uh, because, you know, it's uh, the important thing is for all of us to work together. Um, having said that, there are some things that I think the government could have done differently and that it still should uh, think about doing now. And uh, one of them is actually spending the money that was provided to them by the federal government for the COVID response. And I think mainly in, you know, making sure that our frontline workers are, 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 are being paid enough, you know, and in some cases they're not being paid enough to like actually live in cities like Toronto or, you know, other parts of Ontario. Uh, to make sure that um, uh, our long-term care homes um, are not driven by by profit, but by people and the needs of people, and um, I believe the uh, the uh, deployment of vaccinations and testing, so the on the ground uh, stuff is really important. And you know, when you're sitting on 6.4 billion dollars that's uh, being provided by the federal government for COVID. And you're sitting on it, and if you don't use it by the end of March, it just goes into the uh, the general coffers to to that's uh, earmarked for deficit deficit reduction. That goes against everything, the entire intention of what that money was for. So, I think that Doug Ford has uh, an opportunity to do the right thing, and um, I hope he's listening to what Ontarians have to say when it comes to the use of that money and the way in which uh, we're providing resources for people out there who are who are working on the front lines uh, to protect citizens. Definitely well said. And, you know, that that money, as you said, it was intended for, um, you know, COVID relief supporting Ontarians. And what's sad is that, you know, if, as you said, if that money's not spent, it's sort of a wasted opportunity. And the more the Ford government sort of decides to, I guess, look for ways to save money versus actually providing the most amount of relief to Ontarians as possible, you know, this crisis sort of will extend on, right? So, and, you know, we saw over the right. summer, you know, the premier went on his, you know, summer tour and sort of didn't really focus on uh, making a strategic plan for back to school. And that sort of uh, didn't work out well, as we see as schools are shut down. Um, but so definitely, I, I do hope the premier um, makes that decision to uh, make those adequate investments and help Ontarians out during this tough time. Um, so, Michael, af after COVID, what sort of policies and you know changes do you think that this province needs to sort of, I guess, um, lift us out from what we've you know experienced during this devastating crisis, but also some you know things that will push us forward in generations to come? I know you know during your you know your awesome right. leadership campaign that you had, you you had a lot of fantastic policy ideas. I was wondering you know if if there was other things perhaps you had in mind that um, would really you know fast track Ontario to once again, you know, be not only a leader in Canada, but across the world and uh, make us successful for generations to come. One of the things that COVID has done has really exposed the cracks in the system. So public education, healthcare, um, social services. I think that after COVID, uh, one of the things that we have to do immediately is really understand, you know, were, were, were like those pieces that were, um, that were really tested through COVID, like our, you know, uh, social services and uh, just education system. Like, I don't think the educa education system ever thought that it would be in a situation like it is today, both post-secondary and, uh, and uh, JK to 12. Um, and, um, and we just need to really understand um, where those, those cracks are within the system. And we don't have to start after COVID. This is something we can be thinking about now because uh, we're being exposed to uh, some of these challenges. Um, I was just reading today, one, uh, uh, a university in, um, in Ontario has filed for, uh, for bankruptcy, I believe. Um, there's another term used, but basically um, it's gotten to a point where they can't afford to keep going on. Um, you know, we've got um, education systems now uh, with billions of dollars in backlogs of uh, infrastructure, uh, deferred maintenance and new infrastructure need, um, you know, including our ventilation systems. We've got healthcare systems that can be overwhelmed, you know, if numbers keep fluctuating the way they are. Um, and just the way in which we as a province um, respond to, uh, to crises like a pandemic or you know, other types of um, uh, 
uh, issues that are connected to not only Ontario and Canada, but to the world, like our, our economy, our, you know, the health, um, you know, so I just think that we really need to think about, you know, how to protect ourselves as a, uh, as a country, as a province, and really put in place the, uh, the, the, the tools necessary to mitigate the impact of, you know, the type of um, challenges that, you know, are, are seem to be getting more extreme as, uh, you know, as, uh, as the world becomes, uh, countries become closer and closer to each other. Definitely, for sure. Very well said. Yeah, you know, and I think um, we should be able to use this, uh, what we've experienced during this pandemic as a learning opportunity to perhaps uh, prevent future crises from happening. Definitely. Um, right. So, Michael, on a, on a more positive note, it's also the beginning of uh, Black History Month. And, um, you know, it, there, there's a lot to, I guess, reflect on and uh, celebrate uh, during this month. Uh, and, and I know, you know, as a you know prominent Black politician in Ontario, uh, I think, you know, your success and what you've contributed to the province is something, uh, you know, we should all look up to and celebrate as well. Um, but we've also seen, you know, in general, just this past year, um, Lots of, you know, devastating incidents with, you know, systemic racism. Uh, and as a result, we've seen the rise of, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, but we also saw, you know, the, the riots at the U.S. Capitol a couple weeks ago and how, you know, law enforcement sort of responded to that versus, you know, compared to how they would respond to a Black Lives Matter protest. Right. And so with, with so much to sort of reflect on this month, you know, what, what do you think this, you know, Black History Month means to you, um, what do you think that people should also be focusing on and reflecting on uh, during this month with all that we've gone through? Um, the last, the last several months of, I think it, it, there's been an awakening that's taken place, um, not only in Canada and America, but around the world um, regarding how we treat one another. You know, the, the George Floyd, um, you know, tragedy that took place was really a, um, I would say a, a point where the, our trajectory changed as a um, as as North Americans when it comes to um, the treatment of of people in general. And um, I've always said, you know, being the the former minister of anti, for anti racism in Ontario, I've always argued that fighting racism is part of I think you know a reflection of our value system, and it is a moral imperative, but. There's also another side that you know I, I'm hoping that people start to, to to key in on, and that's lost opportunity and our economy. You know, um, that person who doesn't get to go to post secondary, who's smart, could be the person who develops the next vaccine. You know that um, you know the uh, a person uh, not utilizing their you know education and uh, not becoming, you know, the person they are is uh, not only a challenge for that person, but it's a lost opportunity and it impacts our economy as Ontarians. So I think at the end of the day, we need to make sure that people understand that fighting racism is not just about the person that it impacts directly, it's about the indirect influence as well. And uh, I just wanna build an Ontario where everyone has an opportunity to reach their potential. And if someone wants to work hard, uh, if someone follows the rules that they live in a society where they're protected and uh, opportunities, uh, you know, presented. And uh, that's the type of Ontario I want to build. And I think Black History Month is a reflection of, you know, the men and women who have fought against, um, you know, prejudice and, and racism and uh, and persevered. And it's for me, it's, a, it's the opportunity to tell those stories and uh, and share not just Black Ontarian history, but, you know, Canadian history. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn and to, uh, to, to learn about each other and to come closer as people. Definitely well said. And exactly, you know, this is an opportunity for everyone because it's, it's as you said, when, when we tackle systemic racism and we, we sort of build those bridges, it's not only, um, a, you know, making sure that it's a quality between everyone, but it's also good for everyone because the less, you know, systemic racism we have in society, it does help our, you know, economy. It, it does help our society, you know, grow. So um, very well said for sure, Michael. Um, before we go though, I, um, you know, 
everyone knows you as uh, MPP Michael Koto. Everyone knows, you know, the fantastic work that you've done in politics. Um, but I thought, you know, maybe we should give an opportunity for, you know, people listening to sort of learn more, of, you know, about you personally, you know, what, what, what's some of your, you know, favorite things, what's, what's some things you like and don't like. Um, so I thought we, if, if it's okay with you, we could play a quick one minute round of uh, rapid fire where I ask you just a couple of questions and you sort sure. of, uh, you know, share your fun opinions with it. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to hit the timer here and we got one minute and just try to answer as many questions as you can. All right. Three, two, one. Okay. What's your favorite breakfast food? Is it sausage or bacon? Which one's better? Bacon. Awesome. Uh, is it okay to put pineapple on pizza? Absolutely. So when you're, when you're eating cereal, do you pour the cereal in the bowl first or the milk? Cereal. Awesome. Uh, who's your favorite eighties uh, band? Duran Duran. Awesome. Uh, who's the greatest Toronto Raptor player of all time? Is it Vince Carter, Kawhi, DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry? Um, you know what? I like Vince Carter because that's when, you know, the excitement was like, it was just a different feel of we were like this up and coming team. So I, I don't know. That's, I, I don't want to pick one, but I like Vince Carter. <laughs> awesome. Uh, the timer was up. I want to ask you one last question. I bet a lot of young people are interested here. Uh, who do you think's better, Drake or The Weeknd? Um, I'm just going to say Drake, even though I love The Weeknd, I love his music. I'm just going to say Drake because, uh, you know, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of his music and he just has, his library is just way more much larger and uh you know he's uh he's uh, he's proven himself to to represent our community well definitely yeah he's he's repping the six pretty well uh well that was that was really fun thank you so much michael for uh playing rapid fire and also for coming on the show this was this was really fantastic yeah thank you thanks for doing this and uh for getting stories out there and uh for just being so interested in uh in making ontario a better place i appreciate that Thank you. And thank you so much for all the work that you do. It's, it's really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks.